Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Walid Shari. I am basically uh, a community lead of uh, two groups, the AWS for the, the Eastern Province in Saudi Arabia and the uh, Docker uh, meetups. Um, I'm, I like community and I like sharing, and this presentation is about openness, OpenShift, OKD, and my uh, mentor is Joseph Mir. Uh, Joseph, do you want to present yourself? Yes, I'm Joseph Meyer. Um, I'm Meyer. a cloud architect and evangelist at Rodi and Schwarz in Germany, and uh, we are with uh, we are using OKD three since uh, two years, and we are excited that uh, OKD four got released a few weeks ago, and yes, we are trying to get a live installation on vSphere for you. Okay, so this is mostly hands-on. Uh, we will start with the vSphere first, and then we, uh, the next hour we'll start with the Azure. Uh, but let's, because it will take some time, we decided that we will show you something running first. So what we are expecting after the installations. So we're expecting to see basically this console, the uh, OKD console, and if you click on Administrator Home, Overview, straight after the installation, you should have the cluster ready, the control panel ready, but we didn't include the operators from Red Hat. So you have two operators uh, regarding uh, Red Hat sample and uh, OpenShift samples are not done, and the storage is not done. That's why it's degraded. So this is what you expect at the end of the installation. Uh, this installation was done on uh, one, two, three master nodes, and one, two, three worker nodes. And you can see the specs of these nodes. This is the OKD console uh, view. If you want to look at the vSphere console view, you can see that basically we have these VMs and we have a bootstrap node. Uh, it's not needed actually now. Uh, we can just uh, power it off. I hope I power off the bootstrap, not the vCenter. Okay, good. Uh, we used BFSense, but it actually delayed us. Uh, it caused so many issues, so we dropped it. So that's what you should see from the vSphere. You should see the VMs, and you should see the IB addresses, uh, because they have the VMware tools built in. And one important component of the installation is the load balancer. That's how the load balancer should look like, and that's the end point at the end of the day. If it all looks green, that's good. Uh, but if you you can see that the load balancer already has the bootstrap also, but it doesn't matter. And the ingress has uh, just needs two nodes. Uh, so there is one node which is, uh, which is not participating in the ingress, which is okay, fine. So that's what we're going to see at the end. Okay. Now, uh, what's the plan? The plan is that we start the installation and then we can talk about it. So we need to go to the console. So I have uh, so everything. We try to do everything, me and Joseph, from the uh, the documentation. So we you have to start with OKD IO, uh, uh, basically, and you go to the documentation. There is the documentation will point you to a GitHub uh, uh, to a GitHub repo for the OKD. Yes, and on the OKD there is guides. And under the guise, there is user provision infrastructure vSphere Terraform. So this is one of the installations that is when you provision uh, the infrastructure using Terraform. The other installation, which is, go to the slide. In, in, any, in any OpenShift installation, OKD installation or OpenShift installation, basically the installation uh, ends to be OpenShift install, create cluster. That's it. Yes, so that's as simple as it is. But different environment will have certain different prerequisites, so that's what we're going to take care of. So let's go now and see. So I have here, if I want to do open shift, uh, create cluster, open shift, install. First thing, uh, check. Especially if you're running OpenShift and OKD, check if you have the right OpenShift install. You could be running uh, a different version of OpenShift install. So the, the first 
uh, thing that hit us before is uh, which version that we're using. And I just say create cluster. I prefer to give it a directory where it saves its artifacts. And in this directory, I already have an OpenShift install. Uh, this OpenShift install has my environment, okay? So let me not run it and show you my environment, how it looks like. Oh, sorry, it's a, uh, it's uh, it's all config.yaml. I put, so, so this is a YAML file, but you don't need to worry about it because this gets generated by the installer itself. Okay, we can generate it. So it asks you things like, uh, for example, if I'm installing on vSphere, you need to know what is the vCenter and you need to know uh, what cluster you have inside vSphere, what's the data center, what's the data store. And if you want uh, automated install, uh, what is called infrastructure provision uh, installation, you just give it two things, the ingress VIP and the ABI VIP. And these are floating addresses that will be um, maintained by Kiva Life B. Of course, you need the administrator. You need certain privileges. You don't need full administrator privileges, but I'm using full administrator privileges. And, uh, and you need the SSH key so that you can do some troubleshooting. I actually run extra step that I am using, so just in case the internet or query goes down or there is an issue or there's contentions, so I'm doing also an offline registry. This is this section. Okay, it's now. This is optional. You don't have to do that, but um, yes. at least um, in lots of company environments, I think you will mirror the images uh, just to have them in, in place and yes. are not dependent of uh, external registries. Yes. So if I run the installer, okay, uh, because the file is not there actually, I copied the wrong file there, it will ask me these questions. It will ask me which public key I need, so I don't need to write any YAML, I just select which key I want to use, what platform, so basically it's the same for any other platform, I'll select this here. Uh, keep me honest, uh, Joseph. VCenter, so it's vcsa.lab.local. This is a home lab, uh, one machine, then R620. A username, uh, administrator, and vsphere.local. And password. Hope I get it right. If I get this right, it will connect to vsphere. Oops, I didn't get them right. I click the password. But you could also use the install config YAML, I think. And yes. it won't ask you. Uh, yes. But it's uh, uh, good to see the, uh, the questions. If this fails, we'll use the... Okay, it's connecting. Oh, it failed. Let me find the password. Maybe I forget the password. Uh, yeah, it's correct. Okay, last time. The live demo, so this is expected. <laughs> uh, B Center, server appliance, map, locker. Beta. Okay, so it was the password. So it's talking with the... vSphere and yeah, shows so you. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Joseph. So um, it's the same for Azure. If uh, you enter the credentials, it will uh, connect to the system and provide you with information. This at this step, you can be sure that the connection is uh, uh, yeah stands and uh, yes, you can proceed. So Yes, yeah, so in my data center, I have three data stores. I have one KubeCon, which is basically empty now. It's an SSD disk, uh, around 890 gig. Okay, so I select this data store, and then it will ask me about the network. Again, as uh, Joseph said, it gets this information from the vCenter. If I look at the vCenter, I have these networks. So basically, I will select this network OKD.
Okay, I need a floating IP address, and this IP address should be non used floating. So uh, this is one of them. And I need another IP address for the ingress. So this is the other one. Now, this domain is my home domain. I put local and cluster name, con. Let me. Okay, so that it's kubecon, so I get it from the DNS, it's kubecon 2020 EU. I will tell you why I need to get it. I need, um, oops. Uh, or. Kubecon. What was it again? Sorry. You get it, uh, grab ABI from the DNS. Just to double check. So it's KubeCon 2020 EU. KubeCon 20 EU. That's my cluster name. Full secret. Uh, I saw the fake secret in the chat. You can take it from there. I don't see the chat. Okay, good. I can. Uh, what is it? What is this full secret? I will paste it. Okay, I have it here. So I have this document always. Yeah. So the full secret is just fake. Uh, uh, unless you want uh, Red Hat operators, you can put the uh, full secret from try.openshift.com. Now, this will start the uh, infrastructure provision. We have been trying it. We have a problem with the uh, virtual IB, the ingress, uh, but several people on the uh, Slack have, or have success with it. So you see now what it's doing? It's pulling the image. So you don't need to do anything. You just sit and relax. You just basically fill the information. You didn't even touch the YAML file. And you sit back and relax, and it will pull the image. And it will create the infrastructure. So it will build the image and cache it. So if you do another one, most likely it will not be doing it. And that's what happened here. It's reusing my old uh, image. Now don't it will create the confused. infrastructure resources. Don't get confused by the message that it's pulling an RH cos image. It's a, in fact, it's a yes. Edward Core image. So messages. Yes. And, uh, and if you see here, it created the folder on vCenter, it created the folder. And in this folder, there is a template. It's powered off because it's a template, it's not a VM. And from this template, it will start cloning the, uh, the what what machines are required. So uh, because I didn't uh, customize it, so by default, it will create three masters and then will create three worker nodes. And of course, it will start with the bootstrap. Okay, if we go back, okay, it's still creating the resources. So let's go to the slides. You, you could show you could show maybe in vSphere yes. um, how it creates the resources in the in the vSphere. Program. Okay, it started. So it started. It created the Bootstrap node, which is the most important uh, node to initiate the cluster installation. It's only required during the cluster installation. It will run the etcd, which is the key value data store that keeps information about your cluster. And then we'll start the three masters. Uh, okay. Later on, it will start basically the worker nodes. Because the worker nodes depend on the masters to start. Uh, and for this, the only requirement for this installation, the only requirement is just two entries on your DNS. Okay, and this is all in the documentation. In one hour, I cannot really tell you much, but in the resources, I have basically asking you to join Def Nation or join OpenShift TV. They have already created several. Uh, videos and several blog posts regarding the installation steps and uh, the different mm. options that you have. But it okay. should be uh, should we delete it because we know in our setup it does not work. Should we show as installation with Terraform because maybe okay. you're in luck sure. and get it sure. running? Yes, but I just wanted to show how easy it is this one. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, so it will wait until the bootstrap completes. But let me delete it as he uh, Joseph said. So the deleting is very easy, actually. 
you don't need to enter any information you just say destroy the same command and this is good because basically it cleans up after itself so you can, you can see now uh, I, I don't have the VMs I just have the template and most likely to remove this also okay so this yeah. is the uh, the easiest way to install uh, OpenShift on vSphere um, okay the other way the other way as I showed you in the documentation in github uh, okay where is the my here using Terraform so Terraform is a very popular uh, infrastructure uh, IAC infrastructure as code tool and instead of using uh, instead of provisioning the machines yourself doing the template and cloning them and whatever it you just enter the information that you require and it will install it for you so what is the information It's exactly the same as we saw before the cluster id the cluster domain what kind of base domain you have what is the vcenter uh, server well, here it's called vsphere server but it's actually the vcenter server the vcenter user which has certain permissions and these permissions are defined in the documentation in okdio uh, so normal stuff okay now, what is not normal? It needs the bootstrap ignition, control plane ignition. So this is basically the OpenShift install program that will give it to you. Okay, let's go. Uh, and we have a cluster, uh, by the way, the running. So we need to destroy it also. So if I go to the, uh, to the, um, will be zero. So this is my Terraform directory and I have a cluster running. So what I need to do, I need to uh, delete it. And I delete it this time using Terraform. Terraform destroy auto approve. So it's a, um, you should take care of out, about um, um, sometimes to delete also the Terraform TF state file. Where yes. Terraform stores the state. We had uh, a few yes. moments of trouble with that. Um, if you don't delete yes. it, then Terraform will have something in the history and some sometimes com uh, complain about it. It's good to yes. know that the OpenShift installer is also based on Terraform. So, um, and uh, if you want to customize something, you could, in theory, uh, change the Terraform files. They are in the inst um, OpenShift installer repository. Build it and uh, you have an installer exactly matching your infrastructure. That's uh, one nice thing about the installer. Yes. So, as Joseph said, uh, my first initial try was with Terraform. And I had the... Uh, several issues because basically the Terraform assumes that you have a cluster and I just have one host. So to solve this, I added the host to the cluster and it assumes you need resource pools. And to, and to have a resource pool, you need more than one host in a cluster. So what I did, I enabled DRS to basically get over this requirement. But because I was playing on and off, uh, there is a, a file, uh, terraform.tf state was created and I had other issues and I couldn't solve them. Uh, so basically Joseph showed me how to do it. Uh, just if you have a Terraform, delete the state file or make a backup and uh, start fresh. Uh, Terraform is a declarative tool, but we have found out that there are some corner cases and you don't need really to learn a lot about Terraform. All you need to do now, if you go back to vCenter, uh, we'll find that basically uh our our cluster is done done and this is the other cluster we're using the ibi so now we can start a new cluster okay so what we need to remove uh, we have certain files that are hidden i need to remove this so it if would be good to know it, it would be good to know what's the purpose of this file is because because if you don't delete them um and you call the installer twice uh, you also will have trouble that your yes. installed config change uh, won't be recognized uh, until you delete these files. We, and they are hidden, so uh, it's very easy to stumble about uh, uh, above yes. uh, that. Yep. Just delete so, them in the start and yep. you're fine. Yes. So the log file is the log, uh, all the log file from the previous state. The Terraform TF state is the most important one to delete. And the OpenShift install state because also there are certain things related to certificate. If I believe that, uh, <coughs> especially if you cross the 24 hours, that might cause you uh, installation issues. Okay, 
Now I have deleted the, the files. And what I need to do, if I am starting from scratch, I need to add the context of my environment in terraform.tfvars. What's this context? Uh, this context is basically, again, the cluster name, what domain you are going to use, uh, what's the cluster uh, domain, the vCenter credentials and the vCenter uh, name, what data center you're going to use. Okay, it's correct. Uh, here, the data store is saying SSD01, which is okay. I have another one. And what template you're going to use. And this template, you need to upload it actually earlier. Uh, Terraform doesn't upload it for you. And you need to upload it to a content library. So if you go to the fees here, and if you say content, okay, uh, maybe it's easier to go through the menu. And if you say, where is content libraries? Yes, content libraries. And you find basically I have uploaded the template here. Okay. Now, one section is that it requires an ignition file. So this ignition file, you need to create them using the OpenShift install command. Okay. Uh, we are fixing MAC addresses because we need to use DHCP. So the prerequisite for uh, uh, user provisioned infrastructure, you need to have a certain services around it, which are DNS for the host names and DHCP, so that basically you can um, you can uh, map MAC to IP addresses, and you can map, then you can have, exactly yes. So what we are missing now in this file is the ignition files. So how are we going to do this? Again, using the OpenShift install program. So if I say OpenShift install on, okay, I was trying to get my history, but OpenShift install. Okay. Create. Uh, yes. uh, let me, uh, I can, uh, sorry, oh, okay. Uh, basically, it will ask me the same question, but if I have a main, uh, uh, if I have uh, an OpenShift, I can get the other one. Okay, let's do it. OpenShift. Install, create, um, install. Configs. Config. Sorry? S I, I think. Oh, with S. Yes, I think so. I have one. I, I have one. Um, As there's a backup. So, yes. Yes. Uh, one, one nice. Well, one nice side effect is that uh, the installer will delete your install config YAML for some reason. So uh, you should um, take a backup of that before you call the installer. Yes. And let's reduce the um, compute to two, just in case. And yeah, it looks fine, home lab. Mm -hmm. And the, okay, it looks fine. The SSH key is okay? Uh, yes. So we, can, so we can SSH and two CDMs, okay? Yes. Okay, so if I have the install.config, I just run the uh, installer, which is again OpenShift install, create. Uh, so this time I need the ignition files so that uh, my Terraform can consume them. Create the ignition files, correct? Configs instead of configs, files. Con ignition yeah. configs. Yeah, make me honest. Uh, I don't need to install, uh, specify directly because basically. Uh, need to be, oh, okay. So there was the ignition files here. I need to delete them. Let's delete them. And also the Terraform. T uh, no. Yes, oh, was warning sorry. me about them. There. Yes. Mm. So let's delete them and start from scratch. Okay. Now what's the result? The result is the ignition files that were created. If you can see. Uh, so I have the bootstrap ignition file, master ignition file, and uh, I should have worker ignition right. file. Yes. Now, what is this ignition file? Think about it as uh, a way to tell the Fedora core OS how to configure itself. Okay. Now, I and need to... It's applied to ZVM in the first start. Um, a Fedora core OS will wait for ignition file, and um, we provide it to uh, Fedora core OS through Terraform. Uh, there is a specialty on vSphere. vSphere does, because uh, the bootstrap IGN file is rather big, I think it has a 200 kilobyte, and it's not possible to provide um, um, a vCenter with, um, with such a big ignition file. That's why, maybe you can show this short 
ignition file valid yes i can there is one trick i do when i copy the file i copy extra characters to make sure that i copied the right file because sometimes you think that you copied the file but you didn't yeah. you didn't so oops okay oh, sometimes so i add characters you have to provide a chain of ignition files for the bootstrap um uh, can you show that again valid you want me to show the ignition file correct yes i know uh the terraform tfos um okay yes. let, let, let me get the worker file so that i can copy it there yeah okay so yeah so as you so see basically as you see the worker um, and the master ignition files are very short as uh, the same is for the bootstrap igen uh, file and the reason is that in the uh, ignition file there is a source defined maybe you see it in the first line um, and this https address is uh, at least for the ignition for the bootstrap ignition maybe buddy can show it in a second yes okay um, again the same trick i copy extra characters mm -hmm. just to make sure that i have the right file and here is the bootstrap ignition it's really uh, long mm -hmm. okay and it's in base well, actually it's not in base 64 it's json so uh, if you want to look at it use jq dot and you can look at it and it has all the information that you need so it has basically what it what kind of uh, ignition file now fedora core os uses version 3 uh, open uh, open shift uses version 2 so basically be careful with this now i don't know why it adds another key i guess this is a cluster key but uh, that's my key and this key i'm not sure what it is so it has all the information it needs to configure the fedora core os there is a base 64 or there's a certificates there are lots uh, of files it, basically there are lots of files and their content um yes. they are written to the fcos um uh, directories as a storage and they are also defined um, some services that are started automatically on the first boot and um but it, maybe you can show because i, I try to explain that uh, since a few okay. minutes maybe you can show yeah. the uh, terraform tf files again only, okay. only yeah, I, uh, yes um okay. can you show the ignition so, file there's a bootstrap yes. ignition yes there so is, the bootstrap ignition because it's big go ahead joseph yes because um because the ignition file for the bootstrap node is so big you have to provide it um in a, a user web server for it um that web server can serve this ignition file and the bootstrap node will only get uh, this small uh, you see it here on line uh, starting at line 40 43 um this uh, small part um tells um ignition that the master ignition for the bootstrap again will be served from this location and you have to provide either either a gitlab repository or um, um a web server that serves this file and yes. uh, there uh, with this uh, way you can provide um, the vSphere VMs um, with a very small ignition files, um, but the big ignition file will be pulled afterwards in the second phase from the web server. You don't need a full web server. Some people just do a Ruby or Python uh, uh, script yeah. to serve this file, but w yeah. whatever floats your boat, basically. Uh, mm -hmm. But that's good because, for example, if um, Joseph didn't uh, uh, tell me about this, I would have forgotten to copy the bootstrap the technician file to the web yeah. server and that's one step you need to do and an extra step you need to do is that uh, curl it so you have and don't curl it uh, from your uh, i mean from your memory just find it and use the same command that is here same url yeah to make sure that basically because this is the most important one this is what triggers the whole installation if you cannot get to this file the whole installation will not uh, uh, work basically yeah. where's the file it's not copied it no oh, no it got stuck my image the time okay but it's like demo we're expecting this <laughs> okay is it frozen oh, my machine got yeah my machine frozen okay Okay. So let me open another terminal. Yeah. 
uh, the beauty of TMOC. Oh, no, I cannot. Okay. Uh, so I am using a helper node, and this helper node was created by Christian Hernandez. Uh, let me get another idea of this. So, uh, because I am using TMOC, I can attach, hopefully. Oh, okay. I can attach. I need to reset and find out how to reset. Mm. Okay. So, okay. So the ignition file works. Uh, now we can start. Somebody can ready. find out how to reset the mark uh, to this size. It's the same size, but I'm not sure. Okay. So now what can I do? I have the ignition files and I have the TF bars ready. I can start the installation. How do I start Ignition. the installation? Maybe you should this clear time. the screen so we don't get uh, this uh, character mess. Uh, this one, it's uh, I need the reset. Uh, TMAC reset. I don't remember it. It doesn't happen often. TMAC reset window size. So I use Google to find out how to do this. Is there any way to delete TMAX? Yes, there is. Uh, TMAX minus V. Oh, okay. Control uh, TMAC attach minus. No. That's uh, Control V plus Q, which makes flash number. Sorry? There was a command detach. If you go up. Uh, uh, yeah, here it is. Yeah. Okay, but the problem is that I cannot detach from the other one because it's stuck. So maybe ah. I can close this. Is it? Is it? Yeah. Okay, close terminal. Okay. Nice. Yes. I just need to close the other one. Now. Can you can you clear the screen, valid? Ah, uh, because the is she, okay. yeah. Okay. Um, so I need so I need Terraform apply auto approve. Yeah, you, you can do plan if you want, but that's the quickest way. Now, what Terraform is going to do? Going actually to create the infrastructure for you. It's communicating with the V Center to get the state. Uh, it's doing uh, the virtual machine template, checking if it's there or not checking the data stores, doing everything that OpenShift install does. Because OpenShift install at the end of the day is using Terraform. Um, okay, so we can see it's creating the machines, creating a folder. Let's go back to vCenter and see if this is done. Uh, vCenter, I go to home, I go to VMs and templates. Okay, it created mm -hmm. the folder, okay, D4, and I can see it started creating the machines, okay? Um, it's just a matter of time, it will start them up. So, uh, um, normally you have nothing to do um, with the insights, but we will show you a few important steps, just in case if you have uh, trouble uh, getting yes. the system running. So if the VMs are up, um, I think, Walid, we should start with the bootstrap um, VM yes. to SSH into it. But at yes. first we will show in uh, vSphere, uh, yes. If something is wrong with uh, the boot procedure, so because I spent some time on the slides, I would like to show some. It's uh, the slides are just for supporting us while we are talking uh, because there is lots of things that you have to wait. So the takeaway, if you want to ask me, what's the takeaway from this whole hour? The takeaway is that if I want to install OpenShift or OKD, OKD4, it's very simple. It's just OpenShift install create cluster. What's difficult? The difficult part is the if it's a user provisioned infrastructure, the user has to provision this infrastructure. How can he provision this infrastructure? There is, uh, uh, there is basically uh, the uh, uh, the OCB helper. So if you go to GitHub and you say OCB helper, the OCB helper node, this will give you all the services that they require. To, uh, so DNS server, load balancer, web server, DCB, Pixie, and whatever method you need. And actually, uh, if you go at the end, it have the UBI automation for vSphere. If you click on this one, quick start, this other repository, which is under Red Hat official Git repo, have all the different scenarios you might have. Do you want to install with from OVA, or do you want to install with Pixie, or do you want to install static IPs? Are you in a restricted network? The, you don't want the cloud provider, so all the options you have are there. Okay, let's go back and see. Okay, the notes have started. So now what we can do, we can check what's happening with yeah. the bootstrap. 
Okay, the bootstrap came up. Uh, it, this, has, it has taken the ignition file. And uh, you, you got an IP address, it scrolled out of the window, and you have a host name. The host name is Bootstrap. And okay. we, should, we should SSH into it to show this uh, two-phase um, okay. installation. Oops, error. What's that? Oh no, the tags. <laughs> Does not have uh, the permissions for the tags. Okay. Um, Range. But it should yes. um, it should work without that, I think. Normally, the tag is for the data store. The the tag is for the um, uh, for the uh, storage, I believe. Is it? But I, but I think it will work because um, the, the beauty of 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 OKD force installation is that it will start the VMs, they get the ignition files, and you are done. The installer. Uh, mostly, um, the OpenShift installer will provide you with some status messages, but normally you, yeah, you can, you can uh, wait and it will run. You don't need the installer if uh, the resources are created. Now we will. Uh, there is a question. Question is there still from. Yes, yes, it's fake. Uh, yeah, I think they are working on on a, at least the sample operator. Um, because it's uh, degrading after some time with this fake secret. It, is it 100? Eight? Uh, it is 100, yes. Yeah. We tried it before. <clears throat> That's why I know the IP address. Everywhere. There is no host. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's what you usually do uh, because it takes time. So basically, you try to figure out uh, is everything okay or not. First thing that uh, the bootstrap needs to do is to pull images because basically it's dependent on containers to start. So, yes, it pulled one image, that's good, and it will keep pulling. How you can check that? You do BSAUX prep for Bodman. It's pulling images using Bodman. Yes, I have Bodman is still putting images. It's putting uh, into it's booting in two phases before we are thrown out. Um, it will, I think, uh, uh, Valid, it will pull two images. Um, yes. In this images, there is a release payload and uh, tools like Cryo, VM tools, Daemon, and then it will install them and uh, it will reboot. And yes, that's, uh, yeah. yeah, sorry. Go ahead. And yeah, and if it reboots, uh, the first uh, phase of the installation of Fedora Core is, on, on a node is uh, is finished, and every node, also the masters and the workers, uh, do have this two-phase installation. Yes. And I think in a few now, seconds we will be thrown out here. Yes. And another thing, uh, when it pulled the image from Fedora Core OS download the um, uh, CI server or uh, from the download site, it pulled the latest image. But each OKD release has a specific image to it. So if it needs to upgrade or downgrade, you will see that basically it will take care of that. You don't need to worry about it. Because sometimes in other different installation, if you are not going to use the um, official OKD repository, uh, some, some other instructions will ask you to download. Like, for example, this is Greg. Um, he's also from the OKD working uh, group. He has instruction that you have to download the image. and you download just the latest image, don't worry about it. Okay, let's check the masters if there's, uh, the master will not do anything until the boot, uh, until yeah, the you can, grab is. Uh, you could show the masters uh, what they are doing. Okay, now. so so there is lots of errors, but that's fine. Because the the way the um, the controls, uh, the control uh, cycle in Kubernetes and on all these systems, that uh, to get to their desired state. So. If you look at the logs, it's full of error, get error, because basically the bootstrap is not ready yet. So it's trying uh, to go to this uh, IB address and this board, which is basically the ABI internal, which is the machine config server. This is where it will get, the master will get the ignition files from. Yeah. Maybe you but, remember uh, we showed, we showed, yeah, we showed before the yes. Terraform uh, VAS file and we had a little stops also for the masters and workers. And they are all, uh, they are pulling their huge ignition file from, uh, at, from the load balancer. 
and uh, the load balancer in the beginning uh, only contains a bootstrap node. And the bootstrap, yeah. if the bootstrap node has finished with its installation, it will serve the ignition file to the masters. And at this time, uh, you won't see this message again uh, because the master will load um, their ignition files, configure itself, and start with the two-phase uh, configuration. Maybe we uh, can show. We should have thrown out from the bootstrap node valid, I think. Uh, let's see. Uh, not yet. Okay. As yeah, no. You <laughs> just, just in time. Yeah. Yes, and it's very fast to connect. It's the I love it because basically the the two things I love about uh, OKD and uh, OpenShift, the images they use for host, the, the Fedora Core OS or Red Hat Core OS, they are very minimal and they are very easy to maintain, and uh, you are not supposed to configure them except using the ignition file and except using basically a desired state. You are not supposed to SSH into them. Now, if you look, if you look here. This is a different version than the one here. This is uh, this is June. This is July, July 26. This is June 29. So basically, it did downgrade itself so that it can fit to the uh, requirements of this re release version of OKD. Okay, let's do the same command again. Images and see. Okay, so we are getting more images. Uh, I think we'll get over 12, 16 images. Correct? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yes. And it's good to know yes. that um, in OKD and OpenShift 4, um, the o operating system is an implementation detail. They, uh, you don't have to patch um, hosts for security uh, packages, but uh, um, OpenShift and OKD will take care about that. If you upgrade your cluster, you will get uh, a new operating system. It's automatically installed during the update in a rolling up upgrade on each uh, node of your cluster. So you have, uh, you must not take care about OS um, upgrades on your own. So uh, if you look, if you look at the journal, you can see that basically it's it downloaded the release image and now it's starting the uh, bootstrapping the Kubernetes cluster. Usually the bootstrapping takes uh, 10 to 15, sometimes 20 minutes. Hopefully, um, not much because basically the images I have them uh, close by, and if you see these characters, this is basically Arabic characters in Linux, but they are really messed up, so don't use Arabic in Linux. <laughs> uh, okay. We could, um, so, we could, uh, we could, Vali, we could. Um, what do you think about showing uh, OC get pods? Because I think we we could okay. see something already. Yeah, uh, I tried. Okay, so Bodman images. I have the three images. So what did what did do what did did it what did it do with these images? So if we check Bodman, oh not yet. Bodman, oh no, right control. Sorry. Yes. Right CTL. There is a T too much. Yes, it's a live demo. Yes. Expect uh, me to do machines. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not yet. We can do BS. But I don't think there is something yet. Change. It takes a little bit. It's it pulls rather slow. Boy, okay, image. Another is... image. Yeah. You see the log. Okay, starting at CD. That's the most important thing because what the bootstrap will do, it will be its own key value data store for the whole cluster and it will try to provision another cluster. So the moment etcd is up and running, then it will try to scale out to the other nodes, the master nodes. And the moment it scales out to the master nodes, they will start the machine config server and uh, the bootstrap uh, node uh, job has finished. It will uh, basically, you can kill it then. Still the same images. So now because it's starting the etcd certificate signer, most likely we'll find, we should see job. Uh, we should see what's now. I think it will pull. Okay. So, how to start? How to start? As I said, you go to OKD IO uh, and you get basically, uh, you get the um, instructions from there or from this side. Okay. 
Now, one, one of the things it will tell you, if you go to the release page, one of the things it will tell you, it will tell, ask you to run this command, OC Adam. So you don't have OC Adam. You go to the GitHub of OKD and get it from the releases pages. So you, you see, this is the release. And if you go down, this is all the images that are contained on the release. You'll find basically which, uh, this is the client, which is OpenShift client, OC. So it is also OKD client, so it can be actually you can submit a bug report that should be OKD client. That doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. The moment you have this client from the release page, as you saw, uh, you run this command. It will pull the boot uh, OpenShift install and OC and cube control. And you are then you are in your way. Yes. Now, uh, this is the menu, just in case you haven't seen it in the beginning. So what kind of, you don't need to create any YAML, it will create it for you. Now, uh, if I want to do the caching, I just set up certain uh, variables and they use the OC Adam release mirror. The instruction is for this connected environment, but you don't need really need for this connected environment, even if you need to make sure that you are, are not dependent on the upstream, just in case you can mirror them into your uh, own uh, network, okay? So the installation, we said there are two types. There is the full stack automation, which is what we call IPI, which infrastructure provision uh, install, and the UBI, the user provision infrastructure, which is not fully automated. And you can see here, the, the, the fully automated, it will build your network, it will create the load balancers, it will configure DNS, it will provision the VMs for you, it will do the operating system install, it will generate the ignition configs. You don't need to generate the ignition config as you saw that we had to do it for Terraform. But even in Terraform, the installer can take care of that. Um, open shift, open, open uh, system support for the OKD, it's usually Fedora Core, uh, core OS. I think there are talks about CentOS, correct? Yes. Yes. Now, the other thing about why do you want the automation is that you can do the auto scaling out of the box. If it's user provision, you need to make sure that your um, cloud provider, in this case, the vSphere, has the capability to do this. And I believe in 4.5, it has the capability yeah, to do this. That's that's true. So this is I'm the fully automated install. Yes, yeah. let's go back. Um, because um, I, I just uh, uh, want to take the chance to look inside if we have progress. Ah, no, okay, yes. now. Uh, we should, maybe we, you can show uh, OC get pods um, outside of the bootstrap node, because now we are in the bootstrap node. And yes. um, we could do a watch, um, maybe. So one of the things, the artifacts that it creates, it creates this odd directory, and uh, it has the uh, cube config, which is basically the configuration you need to connect to your cluster. So if I say export cube config off, and the cube config, now I can see or see get bots minus a to see what kind of bots I don't have yet because it just is uh, it's still starting. I like to do a uh, watch the, on that. Yes. So another thing I can do, uh, using the OpenShift install, I say wait for, I want to check uh, the status for the bootstrapping. Is it finished or not? I can say bootstrap complete. Yeah. Uh, wait for bootstrap boot. It helps if I type correctly. Yes. <laughs> uh, so it doesn't tell me much. So I, I increase the, the, the verbosity by increasing the log level. Uh, again, it doesn't tell me much. So what I can do, I can actually trail the uh, OpenShift log file. There's a, a log file. It will tell me what state it is on. So it can tell me that the Kubernetes, waiting for Kubernetes ABI to come up. So I'll, unless the ABI server is up, I cannot use OC because OC is basically a client for this Kubernetes ABI. Everything is restful. Everything talks to the ABI. And if the ABI is not up on the bootstrap, I will not, not be able to talk to it. Okay, so as we saw, the installer is very simple. It's text user interface. Uh, it takes the cloud credentials, the vSphere, for example, the vCenter, the administrator, what data store do you want to use, what network you want to use. Uh, and Bootstrap creates a cluster control plane, creates the Bootstrap. The Bootstrap basically creates the master uh, nodes. Uh, so that's the diagram, if you want to see. So from one machine, 
the your installer you it will create the bootstrap node and then the masters will depend on the bootstrap node to get their ignition files and to basically provision themselves to, into the desired state of the cluster and then the worker nodes will talk to the master nodes now the ingress for the applications ingress basically usually gets installed on the worker nodes uh, we'll share the slides this is, slides are from dev nation uh, to give uh, credit to dev nation and barsatar and eric uh, these are actually the slides from the uh, uh, master class for the uh, openshift operators uh, so it tells you basically how you start and stuff like this okay i don't think we will have time to do the autoscaler so let's see it's strange because uh, it, the pulling is, is rather slow so maybe you could, uh, you, could you could uh, do an, a watch on oc get ports all namespaces so okay, maybe uh, we see a little bit more now normally you should yeah you would uh, see um, a list of pending pods this is this is already good because it's talking to the api server already uh, no the api server is not up to us because it yeah but it responds does it uh that it let's, does check. Not have let's, a check. let's go does to not have uh, a resource yes this is this message comes short before you see a uh, lots of pending uh pods I am again on the um, uh, bootstrap node to double check what's happening. Okay, I have more images, but they are not really enough. Uh, yeah. I want to check if these images are actually resulting in container runs. I will try control BS. Okay, that's better. So what I have, I have the etcd. I have the etcd yeah. metrics. I have the etcd member, and I have the machine config server. That's really good because the machine config server is the one that is responsible. How do I check again? I can also check from the load balancer, uh, from the load balancer. Mm -hmm. uh, if I, it's, it looks green, but uh, that's uh, not true. If I do a refresh. Oh, actually I have. The bootstrap is starting to serve the ah. file to the masters. This so means that go, masters, yeah. The masters should be able to pull them and uh, start yes, over. They yes. yes. So maybe you, maybe you, um, you remember that um, before it, the masters were pulling uh, they're polling for an uh, ignition file and now yes. the bootstrap node can serve this uh, ignition file this machine server uh, pod is responsible for that and the master pulled it configured it and now we should but now we should see something with oc get pods uh, it's a third third try uh, here it says still waiting for the kubernetes abi i believe the kubernetes mm -hmm. abi should be ready uh, mm -hmm. But uh, it's not ready because you know. get what minus a is not uh, actually giving an uh, antenna error. That's good. Ah, it's switching over. Errors are good in OpenShift, by the way. In <laughs> <laughs> Normally, everything is fixing itself. <laughs> it's yeah. magic. I can reboot so. the nodes during the installation and don't worry about them. They will get to the same state also. Um, so they are in a loop to get to the desired state. Normally you can uh, you can't break anything because um, the system will fix itself. So yes. we we had we were often in a situation where we thought we have broken something, but um, it's it's rather easy to to fix it. And because OKD is or OpenShift 4 is based on operators, uh, operators yes. are first class citizens. The, this operators will take care about their the pods they are. Um, responsible for and fix itself yes if you have a problem you can also go to slack and uh, openshift dev in the kubernetes slack is basically where you can ask your questions when you have problems or openshift users uh, these are two nice um, channels if you have openshift or okd i believe Open okd is mostly openshift dev correct uh, joseph yes where we are the most time yes I think give me yeah, a fourth fourth <laughs> a fourth fourth yeah. Give me a fourth try. Um I think now we should see the pending pods. I have a strong fee, okay. Thing. Yeah, because pulling is slow. So normally it, it should not take so long. You you will see a list of pending pods. 
and then the cluster, the containers will creating, uh, creating the masters will, masters will configure oh. itself themselves. Okay, they are, I mean, performance is okay for the bootstrap. The bootstrap um, specs is really low for CPUs, 8 gigabyte, but it's doing good. Uh, the master, uh, let's see actually the registry. That's the one maybe that is, I guess my registry is the one that is blocking this. Uh, ah, you are mir uh, using mirroring? Yes. Ah, so basically, okay. this one maybe is the one that is causing us the headache. Mm -hmm. Not really. It's uh, it, it may just not take really. time, guys. It may just take a little bit of time. Yeah. So give it a little bit of time. I want to see the pending pots. <laughs> yeah, every, everybody does. Yes. I want to see the OKD dashboard is my proof of life. So. I, I, that's why that's why I showed it in the beginning, uh, just in case. <laughs> yeah. Normally, but but you can say normally uh, an installation takes 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. If you pull from a from an internal registry, it it, it takes about uh, 30 minutes. So we were yes. um, talking a little bit uh, about the insights because I think it's more interesting to uh, yeah to see the insights as to have a, a dashboard. Um, yes. Because uh, yeah, you you should see uh, what normally happens if you install it. Because yes. normally well, and how to fix. So this things. is my home lab. It's an old Dell server, like five six years old. Uh, it has 40 logical cores and basically memory is good enough, uh, around uh, 320. I killed everything just to basically to make sure that we don't have any contentions or anything. I didn't shut down, I killed actually everything. Uh, but uh, I, I mean at work, if we, I do this at work, it will take, as uh, Joseph said, maybe 15, 30 minutes max. Uh, if you have good SSDs, if you have uh, basically a powerful server, this is really an old server, and you can see the hertz. It's really uh, 1.7 gigahertz. It's very, very. Uh, it's good for a home lab. Uh, I love it. So let's go back well, to the box. <laughs> but we yes. can we can um, let it run because we have uh, the next um, platform. Um, uh, we will uh, install it on Azure, and we can uh, let uh, do the installation uh, yes, what it wants to do, yes. and look at it in the end. But but could you do? Uh, have you seen uh, some pending pods or last try? Not yet, not yet. So basically, if you look at the let's see the logs. Uh, still waiting for the ABI. Mm, okay. I hope the tagging issue. I don't know why it came mm. from. It, it's taking okay. some time. A couple, couple of the other demos, so don't panic. Um, we're not panicking. It'll come. We are live. <laughs> and I will. Yeah, you're live. If it can go wrong, it will. Yes. And, and if it takes too much time, it must be live. Actually, I was worried that I'm not be fresh. Uh, I was I wasn't really fresh this morning, and I needed to do lots of stuff uh, to catch up uh, with the installation. I wanted to do the uh, automated install because I know it's doable. I know people done it, but there is something in my environment that is blocking me from doing it. So it's I couldn't IPI. figure it out yet. Yes. So the automated install for vSphere, very, very straightforward. You just need two entries, one for the API and one for the ingress, and they are floating and they are uh, keep alive D, and it will, this IP addresses will travel with the nodes. Uh, so basically, you don't need to provision a load balancer, and you don't, uh, and you have to have DHCP because it will create the, uh, it will talk to the vCenter to create the VMs. Yeah, uh, so it's it's really an uh, very nice. Uh, I will get it uh, done. Okay, so okay. Uh, what are the issues that we had? As uh, Joseph said, the Terraform TF state. So I like this one. Uh, I like to stay, there is so many, uh, the, one of the, of, of the problems with OpenShift and OKDE, OKD, is that so much information, so much videos are there outside. But if you follow the official Red Hat and the, uh, the Open Commons, the Commons, uh, OpenShift Commons, uh, I think you should be safe. 
and the slack of course so and the, what is the difference between OpenShift and OKD when it comes to installation? First of all, the release format. If it's OpenShift, it will be 4.50 or 4.51. But OKD, you'll see this uh, date. If I go back to the index and you see the different releases, you see Understable. basically, yeah, they are really a little bit different. Where should you go for documentation? It's OKD.io. If you go to OpenShift, there might be some discrepancies in how things are done. So it's better stay OKD.io. Okay so this I is like the also, stable. Yeah, I like also that you can, as he said, change log. If you click on the version, you will see yes. uh, what changed in each, uh, each, uh, each version. And so also the commit message. Yeah. Yes. I like this. It, it's generated automatically. And you yes. can see exactly the commit uh, that... Uh, uh, leads to this entry. And That's actually, nice. you can see what can you upgrade from and what 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 you can upgrade to. You cannot assume that you can upgrade from one release to the other release straight away. You have to check basically. Uh, there is another GitHub from a Red Hat engineer who created the, like a chart that basically draws all these uh, upgrade paths to you. Uh, you can see what uh, Kubernetes release version is using and what Fedora Core OS. Uh, OpenShift 4 is pure Kubernetes with the extensions using operators. Uh, so if you ask me why should I use OKD, because first of all, it's an open source platform. I can use it in a hybrid cloud. Uh, as, as far as I know, it's the only hybrid cloud open source platform that is out there, which is holistic. It will give me logging, it will give me registry, it will give me monitoring out of the box identity, providers, uh, you name it, uh, it comes really, and maybe this is an advantage and disadvantages. If you need something quick and just raw Kubernetes with nothing at all, maybe you can use uh, K3D or K3S, but then you have to do lots of stuff to get it up and running in, uh, in a good shape. So, uh, and when you see this, this is not really a tag that is used on the installer. Actually, when, when you see this one, if I go to this one, for example, and I go to Quay, or we'll show, I found out that if I need to do really uh, uh, OKD and OpenShift, they don't use these tags, they use the digest. So you have to do this trick to get to the digest. You have to go, uh, you have to use the image, uh, and then try fetch tag. And when you fetch the tag, you fetch the digest, not the uh, Docker bull tag. You fetch the digest because everything in OpenShift and OKD is digest. It makes our life a little bit harder, but it's much more uh, immutable, much more secure, much more um, uh, good, best, good practice for uh, configuration management and stuff like that. Let's go back to Joseph uh, Bods. Yeah. <laughs> can you can you do an OC get ah, okay. ah, that's bots. what okay. yes on the first try yes almost yeah that's uh, that's uh, oh we have already one running container uh, one running pod uh, the or yeah don't, here isn't here it is here it is running the network operator is always the first and now um, network is installing installing on the masters. And yeah, now from now on, things will uh, go their way. So OpenShift think... Multis is, is an operator responsible for several networking functionality. Okay, and uh, OVN is the, uh, actually, okay, I need to show you this. So uh, another, descript, uh, another default uh, configuration between OpenShift and OKD. Uh, OpenShift will use the SDN is OpenShift SDN. OKD uh, uses the Kubernetes OVN, which makes it easier if you are going to run Windows container later on. So one requirement for Windows container is to have the uh, SDN as Kubernetes OVN, which comes by default uh, network uh, network configuration option for OKD. I think it's okay, um, Diane, if we explain that because on Azure, the Azure, mm -hmm. Azure installation will have the same um, pods. Yeah. yeah. So if I go here, okay, and if I do BS, okay, so things are running. I have the Cube ABIs. Okay, so the ABI I think is done. Yeah, the ABI is done. So I think the bootstrap completed. 
Uh, the server Maybe. could not find the requested resource. Mm. It's okay. Let let it do its yeah. job. I, it will it will uh, it will work. So maybe in ten minutes we could um, as a master as a workers will uh, join the cluster and we have to approve the CSRs. But maybe yes, we can yes. maybe we can in the meanwhile start the Azure installation. So maybe yes. we could see an uh, a UI afterwards, and then okay. you could explain the operators again. Yes. Afterwards. So. Oh. So Azure installations, okay. Uh, so if you install OKD on uh, on vSphere, on GCP, on uh, Google Cloud, uh, the Fedora core image is available there, or you can download it for vSphere, or the installer will download it. In Azure, it's a special case because the moment Azure was having core OS as an official image, it doesn't have Fedora core OS image yet. In the, so in the, the installer has. In the marketplace, so the uh, the installer has a hack. And if I go back to the releases, uh, so Joseph wrote um, a workaround, and this workaround was available until beta five. But after beta five, uh, this workaround by mistake uh, got got out, and we have a pull request for it to bring it in. Uh, so there is um, yes, so there is a pull request to bring it in. It was merged uh, so, today. Uh, it was merged, so that if we, yeah. we can use the, you want to try the new install? <laughs> uh, I don't know if it, if it, if there is a nightly, but um, I think, yeah, there was a little problem. Um, the, the, the procedure, because the Fedora Core is, uh, image is not available in the marketplace, is uh, the following: the OpenShift installer downloads the Fedora Core image uh, from. Say Fedora Core S side, um, extracts yes. it, uh, decompresses it, and uploads it again to Azure. The problem yes. with that is if you have a slow internet connection, uh, like me, and your yes. upload is slow, then uh, Terraform will time out. So um, yes. our procedure, um, or, or the only workaround at this moment is to uh, use the OpenShift installer, not uh, locally on your PC, but in a in an Azure cloud shell, because if you yes. are already on Azure, things are much faster. Yes. Downloads. So the OpenShift installer is open source for both OpenShift and OKD. The OKD is basically you have to go to the branch FCOS, and that's where basically you find the OpenShift installer. And if you want to participate or help in on the OpenShift installer for the different platforms. Okay, so. So Azure, as I said, the main thing is the OpenShift install. So I already downloaded this beforehand. And the one I downloaded, as I said, the first thing to do is always check the installer. So do version to make sure that you are not using uh, something that you don't intend to use. Because this happens. The moment you go into different version or testing different releases, you, you might get messed up which release I'm using now, unless you have a system in place. Uh, so it tells me that this is from commit because, as I said, uh, we Joseph basically made the pull request. I made the pull request after him because I thought my pull request was better, but it was the same. So I closed mine. Uh, so basically, this was from a pull request. It was not committed yet, but as Joseph said, it's committed today. Uh, to save us time, I will use this because I already know that this one works. Uh, and you can say you can see this, yes. Now, mm -hmm. what I have already clustered up, as usual, so basically uh, here. So I have one cluster up. Oh, maybe I need to log in again. This is uh, vSphere, I think. Uh, no, no, it is uh, local, VCR. yes. This is vSphere local. Yes, here. So this is the developer uh, screen in OKD, and this is the um, default OpenShift monitoring. So you can see the bots, and they are not related. They are not in, so, um, so you can see them, and you can scale them, and whatever. If I go to the administrator, I will see the status. Oh, that's not good. No, uh, uh, but, but this is vSphere again. Again? No. Oh, yes, yes. OK. That's why it's not good. <laughs> You see the confusion when you have more than one cluster? Okay, so how do we get, how do I know which cluster um, is up? 
I can, uh, as usual, I have the cube config file. So I export cube config, uh, install directory, auth, and the cube config. And I ask for the routes, what routes are there? And actually, I'm looking for a specific route, which is the console. I know what it is, but uh, let's check. Uh, I will not get it this way because I need to ask in all namespaces in all projects. Well, this is a pre-installed cluster, isn't it? So this is a pre-installed cluster, just in case that we had issues. Yeah. Yes. So I can go here, for example. I can delete this. So this okay. is a pre-installed um, Azure, a, a yes. OKD cluster on Azure. Just that okay. you uh, believe us that it's uh, it's working in Prince in theory. So I don't have a storage configured, uh, but I have managed premium. This is the differences now. So in VMware, you will basically uh, you will have the vSphere built-in driver by default, which will uh, provision a storage class called TIN. If you need the CSI, you need to do it. Uh, as an after step. In Azure, it will use basically Azure storage. So this is using Azure storage. And you can create different tiers. Uh, you can create different storage classes for this. Okay, so let's kill this cluster. I have to actually, and uh, okay, I will use this time, I will use actually the Azure shell as the um, as uh, Joseph explained, uh, because of the uploading and downloading of the image, this could uh, it would be faster doing it from an Azure shell. Azure shell times out every 20 minutes. So if you want to get rid of this timeout, you use TMUC and you do watch whatever. Okay, so basically you open TMUC and just run a watcher. Or you press enter from time to time, but this or, is not or, uh, Yeah, or no you ask your kids to come around and press enter. <laughs> okay, uh, so I'm in this directory. Uh, I, why do I want to kill? Because basically the quota reasons. Uh, actually, let me kill the other one, the live. Uh, so orbit, uh, because of your quotas, so we have uh, enough. Um, I have uh, enough now, but just in case. Okay. Okay. Destroy cluster minus directly. There's no. Oh, it's not directly. But this is how you destroy a cluster. So if there's anything you learned today, it's how to destroy a cluster. <laughs> Don't do it if that works. Alert, alert. <laughs> Takes a little bit. Usually fast, and if I go to the um, console, okay, I am in the console actually. If I go into the console and I check VMs, for example, I will see some uh, VMs uh, starting to disappear or starting to go into a known state. So I have two clusters, one is running in North Europe, Switzerland, and one is running in East US. Uh, the one I'm killing, I think, is, ah, the one I'm killing is the Eastern, uh, the North Europe one. I was expecting to be contention. Uh, in last Red Hat Summit, there was contention in AWS regions in the in, uh, in US. But uh, today, there was no contention, to be honest with you. It's either Azure is really good, or I was lucky today to provision these clusters. Or the quota system works, because they didn't give me, I, I, my requirement is very small, 80 cores maximum. But it's like, took a week to get me, grant me this quota. Okay, let's go back to the command line. So while this is destroying, we can actually create another cluster. Okay, so you have to be careful when it comes to Azure, when it comes to your cloud, because it's not your machine. So you have, um, you are limited on the size, okay? So slash home, which is non-resistant uh, disk, 
is quite good, but it's non-resistant. Anything you put there, it will get lost if uh, you disconnect the terminal. And slash home slash your user has only five gig blob. So I, my images is around eight gig. If I look, I have, I think, uh, I know I don't have. Okay, actually this is, so the trick is, and it's uh, available in the Git repo of the uh, OKD, is to make directory slash home slash cache. You create the cache on the non-resistant one, okay? And you link to it from your persistent one. This won't be necessary if uh, Fedora CoS um, still will be, finally will be available in the marketplace. Azure and Red Hat are working on that. So we hope that in a few, yeah, in a, in a few reasonable time, it will be available. And you can uh, okay. call this command from your local PC. I love to create directory so that I can limit my uh, devolution of my artifacts for the installations. So I create a directory and I, I love to have uh, uh, debug level high. As I said, the, the key takeaway, how to install OpenShift is OpenShift install create in no matter, is it vSphere, is it uh, or GCB, is it uh, Azure. Okay, press enter. Uh, I'm missing something. Create a ah, cluster. Create class. So what do I want to create? I can create a cluster, I can create a manifest. And this time I want, I'm using the automated install, so I want to create a cluster. So it's asking me which platform, and this time it's Azure. Okay, which uh, region? Uh, you have to be careful with this because there is a quota, and the, the default quota is 20 CPUs. This is not enough, you need at least 28. Unless you customize, unless you customize your installation, which one there. So I need North Europe, yeah. This is where I have a uh, quota already agreed by Microsoft. Thank you, Microsoft. And now this is the domain. This is another requirement. So basically you have to have a domain in Azure in your own account. Okay, cluster name. Uh, what do you want to name the cluster? Let's name it Joseph. Nice, thank you, Walid. Okay, the bull secret. Uh, okay, the trick I do is I have this in the dashboard. So basically, Oh, okay. I cannot write JSON. I'm not very good in JSON. It's fake part, that's all in JSON, but I have to put it in the dashboard. Okay, so it goes and it fetches master machines. It basically checks with Azure, do I have the credentials? The credentials was done earlier, and I'm not good in um, video editing like uh, the YAM, so I didn't record it. Uh, so basically, uh, you need a certain a service account with the, with the certain privileges. It's all documented. It's very straightforward. Um, it needs lots of pri uh, permissions. I, I don't know yes. why, but yes. I, I don't. I think it's very good to have a service a principle with so much permissions, but it's required. Yes. So now that's the step that Joseph told you about. It's trying to obtain the Fedora Core OS. Forget the message obtaining Red Hat Core OS. It it, it, it should say Core OS, and that's it. Maybe I should do pull request. <laughs> uh, and then it, it copies it into the cache file that we did, we created. And it, uh, and it starts decompressing it. If I want to check, now we saw how we check the uh, infrastructure one, the on-premise, the vSphere. If I want to check, I just do refresh here and I should see a North Europe uh, resource group. Okay, nothing yet, it's very slow the console slow, this time the Azure console. Uh, I don't see North Europe yet. Okay, oops. Refresh, ah, okay, now we see a uh, resource group. Resource group is a concept in Azure where basically it's a container that contains all your uh, artifacts, your virtual machine, your storage, your network, your uh, security groups. So we see a network security group, we see a disk, be careful that this, this is the one that are costly. If you are running OpenShift, select the right disk if you want to customize. These are the ones that really cost. Uh, and you can add a GPU if you want, but this is another time. So it started creating the virtual machines. It started creating artifacts. I have two disks and I have two virtual machines. I have the masters. Where, where, is, the is, the, where is the storage account, Walid? Okay, and where is the, uh, where is the storage account? Good question. 
It's not created yet. But the but it should but be the there. Yeah, the virtual machine is already running. There should be an image and a storage account. Hmm. Yeah. Let's yeah. see again. Let's refresh. Sometimes it's just a console. Okay, or we can straight go to storage accounts. Okay, and we should see which ah we don't see the North Europe yet. Strange, huh? <laughs> Maybe it's because it's still decompressing. Let's see what's happening on the shell. Uh, still decompressing the image. It's yeah. So ah, basically, okay. that's good, by the way, because it's creating the machines. Yeah, while uh, just creating mm -hmm. the VMs, it's not really installing them. It's creating all the artifacts that it needs before actually the image is ready, which is good optimization. Um, but I think uh, valid. I think. Uh... No, I I, uh, I think the machines should be created after the image was uploaded. Are you in the right? Um, or was uh, it an yeah, old yeah. one? Maybe it was an old one. No, I'm. Uh, what, the, what I selected North Europe, correct? Yes. Yeah, so it should be. And you cannot see it here because it's not there yet. Let's do no. again. Let's yes, because I think. Refresh. Um, from the uh, in the installer code, um, um, the Terraform starts after the decompression. So Terraform okay. shouldn't run at all. It will take a little bit until the decompression has finished. Okay. Maybe it was the, the old one. So this is the old one. Ah yes. Ah, so this is the one that is deleting. Yeah, yeah. Since no, I, I think thought. it's not. Uh, I wish there is a way to say how this resource. Uh... Because that's the reason okay, yeah, why. Yeah, you're right. The you're right. Machines. Yes, you're right. Can you can we have a look oh, if it's it. still decompressing? Yes. Yes, it's still decompressing. <laughs> and let's look at the. <laughs> the download uh, was faster than the decompression. And the deleting is the slow. Oh, okay, so I think the Azure. Uh, I said Azure was good today. Um, can we can we uh, peek over to uh, vSphere? Um, yes. I hope we don't uh, uh, cause lots of confusion for that, but uh, maybe we have the worker. I'll fix, it. I'll fix it in the video editing. How is that? Okay. Okay, it's still downloading. Okay. Take a while. It's okay, valid. Uh, yeah. I, but that's uh, too long for Bootstrap. Yeah, it's downloading. It's still downloading. The timeout is 40 minutes, so I guess it didn't time out yet. But, but even if it times even, out, it's, uh, yeah. it's you can actually it's, it's still going on. Okay. So we have uh, Bootstrap not finished on vSphere and the decompressing of an image. And this is my fault. I should have done it earlier. Uh, if it was on the cache, and that's the difference now. You saw in vSphere, it was on the cache, so it started straight away. But here, it's not on the cache, so basically, it's taking its time to get the image and then decompress it. And the decompressing and uploading. Okay, it uploaded, so we should see a new resource group. If now, we do this. Yeah. Yes. So if you go to the resource groups, we should see a new North uh, Europe resource group. It takes a little see. bit because the web UI is always, um, it, even if the resources are created on Azure, the web UI takes a little yes. bit to show them. Okay, let's see the, what's uh, on the console. So on the console, it's telling me that basically Terraform, Terraform has started. In it. It downloaded the Azure provider, and it's initializing the modules that are in the Terraform uh, code manifest. So there is a Bootstrap, there is a DNS, there is a master, there is a VNet. These are all resources. The Bootstrap is an OpenShift resource, but the rest is basically is Azure resources that Terraform will use to provision uh, to provision basically the OKD. And that's why uh, what, that's what happened here. So when I said the uh, Joseph uh, code got missing here because the Terraform provider was changed here and it required certain changes on the code and by mistake, I guess, uh, it got dropped. Uh, so there was an upgrade to the Azure provider. That's after, why a lot of... Beta 5. 
lots uh, uh, lots of people have had problems had reported problems with uh, error messages from uh, the installer uh, telling them that uh, some page blob or yes. block blob uh, problem occurred. Yes, yes. and uh, we fixed that. Um, it was only a, a, a small change that was necessary, and yes. it was merged today. And I think in the next release of OKD, it will be uh, it will be in. Next release will come out um, next no uh, the week after next week. Okay. So you will have uh, Azure support in an official way. Don't yes. have to. As uh, you see, there, uh, so one one type of storage containers in uh, Azure is beige or block. Uh, block are aligned to 512, and that was the error message. The other issue uh, that was uh, dropped was the source URI. So the source is a cached image, is not a URL. So this is, was the other change. So it's very easy to participate on the uh, fixing things, especially if you have Joseph backing you up as a mentor. It's really <laughs> amazing. <laughs> yes. Uh, so that's the issue. I have a strong feeling um, it, that the decompression uh, has ended and that uh, we should see a resource group. Yes, so now. we are seeing resources creating. We see VNets, we see uh, Azure Private DNS, so it's recreating the subdomain. Uh, let's go to the portal and see. Well, I am in the portal. Okay, so let's refresh. Okay, okay. we see new. Yeah, new Joseph. Ah, uh, Joseph here. So. If I refresh here also, because it's also, I mean, the user interface of Azure, you need to refresh several times. I think it will create like 22 records Mac, uh, 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 at the end. Now, what do we have? We have a load balancer, which is expensive. And we have basically the public IP address and the virtual network. We don't have the VMs yet. The first so thing... That is crucial. Is um, maybe you can show the storage account. It should already be created. It's still so. Uh, it the is creating it. It's, it's creating it. Let's see it. Let's go and see it. So I love uh, basically the cloud shell on Google and uh, Azure. It's uh, really nice. It's very very convenient. If can I go to the storage it? accounts. Yes. Ah, okay. This way also works. Yes. Okay. And I refresh. I should see North Europe. Yes. Here is Joseph. North Europe. And if I look, what, what, the first ah. entry. It's the first entry. You can take that. Ah, the, okay. So the first in. Yes. Uh, I did storage account. So why did? Okay. Uh, you, there was a. You pressed the resource on group. The interface. Yeah. Okay. So this is the storage account for the resource group that created recently. Okay. And I have different types of files. We are in containers. And basically, there's one for the bootstrap ignition file. OK, it's up. And it's uploaded. And the other one is the VHD. So this is the initial phase of, Terra for, uh, of the Azure installer. If you have these two, you are in good shape. And you saw it's 8 gigabyte. That's why you have to be careful when you are uh, installing several releases, uh, because you, you could run out of space. Mm. OK, uh, let's go to the was, resource group again. It was creating an image, so um, the VMs should also be created soon. Maybe we have yes. one if you scroll down. Yes, uh, by type. I have virtual networks. They should be up. Uh, Next a few seconds. Let's refresh. But, this is the uh, takeaway for Azure, if refresh. <laughs> The nice thing about the Azure IPI installer is that you have to take care about nothing. You have to prepare the service principle one times, um, um, as it's uh, yeah, it's documented very good. It's very yes. you can have a service principle in a few minutes, and then you only uh, call the installer, create cluster, um, Azure, enter your credentials, and here you are. So the it service takes around. principle is a bit confusing uh, because now if I want to check do I have the right service principle, I go to the, uh, it's not really service principle. If you search for service principle, most likely you'll not find it. Yes. It's in the, uh, no, you go uh, to the application registration and then you say view all applications this directory. 
and that's the service principle I created. Mm -hmm. And actually, it created others. Uh, uh, these, it cre okay, it so created it created something own. for Ingress, yes. And I think that's uh, the reason why the uh, initial uh, service principle has so much, so high permissions that it can yes. create um, other service, service principles on its own. Yes. Um, so I guess this information is safe because the password, there is a password related to the service principles and there is permissions. And this is what you need to check. You need to check that you have the directory graph. And I'm not sure if this is uh, because it worked for me before, but last, the last installation, we saw that uh, uh, somehow uh, it's not granted for me, but it will tell you here. There will be a warning and then you just uh, follow what the warning tells you. In my company, um, only a special group of people is allowed to grant. So uh, I personally cannot grant um, service principles on my own. And that's why this is a yes. two-phase um, yes. yeah, procedure. So in VMware, there is something called VMUG Advantage, where you can uh, have one year evaluation license for almost all products of VMware. In Microsoft, there is the inter, uh, what is it? The developer basically uh, subscriptions, which will give you like 150 US dollars per month uh, access to Azure, and it will give you actually in the beginning if you don't have an Azure account, it will give you 200 free uh, account, and later on uh, you get like a quota 150 US dollars per month, and you cannot use this in production. This is basically uh, development test work. But it's good enough. It's really excellent. So this is what we call a developer subscription or something like that. Uh, it's still creating the blob images for the machines. Okay. Now, if we look somewhere, we can actually uh, let's uh, see. Let's see if it created the virtual machines or not. Yes. No, so we have. Really? Uh, this is OKD. This is not uh, the current installation. Sorry, <laughs> we don't first, have. <laughs> um, first uploading and creating yes. a VM. Right? I, I was surprised. Yeah, it's always confusing if if you have lots of uh, resource groups in Azure yes. to mix now, things up. Yes. Now, if you ask me, do you want automated install or do you want it in, uh, user provisioned install? It depends. If you are in a company that is heavily regulated and you cannot change the host names, the current automated install will, uh, for a reason, it will create a hash. So you cannot know the names in advance unless you change your process. So do you want to be on control or do you want the installer to be in control? That's the question. So if you can answer this question, then you can decide uh, if you want it automated or uh, user provision. So user provision has uh, advantages and automated has advantages. It's not like uh, I should always go with automated. Everyone has an advantage. Okay, if you want more slides. The other thing that I like about uh, OpenShift, the concept of operators, OKD or OpenShift basically are operator. Uh, so if it's OpenShift, you can call it operator container platform. If it's OKD, you can call it operator Kubernetes. Uh, I don't know what. Um, uh, so what are operators? Think of them as that you have Joseph and you have uh, Christian Hernandez and Chris Short and Diane and everybody from Red Hat in one uh, room. And anything you can ask about OpenShift or OKD, they will answer it for you. So basically you are, you are putting the whole experience of all uh, of the operations uh, or the developers in one uh, package. That's what it is. It's basically application lifecycle management uh, capitalizing on all the knowledge that oper uh, human operators have. So they are just regular bots and there is a controller. So it's a controller and a custom custom uh, resource. And there is, a, uh, and if you, and everything you configure using the custom resource definition. So basically even how to manage your Kubernetes environment becomes much easier. Yes. So this is how an operator look like. This is custom resource definition. And uh, this is just a hypothetical example. If I have something called cars, this is how I will define it. And it becomes a first class citizen in Kubernetes. So what kind and of first class citizens do we have? Go ahead, Joseph. So, um, maybe you remember that um, in OKD3, we had also uh, API extensions 
but yes. I don't think that they did it with operators. Um, I think they were yes. extending the API server itself, but with custom resources, yes. you actually yes. can extend um, the API um, of Kubernetes with own resources. And yes. um, this is a mechanism that's not um, proprietary, proprietary uh, for, you know what I mean, uh, for yes. OpenShift or OKD, but it's a plain Kubernetes. And if you write the um, operators with a series of operator SDK, um, we we also use it in my company. It's very easy to write operators on your own. If you yes. if you have written um, operators with that, so you will and see the source code. You will immediately um, see how they work because there is always yeah maybe maybe you can show show one. Um, uh, actually, each of, Chris Short. Chris Short did like a two hours uh, workshop on okay. uh, how to write operators using Ansible. Now, ah, nice. uh, an idealistic person, an idealistic person on, um, on, uh, I mean, he would say, oh, no, this is the wrong use of uh, Ansible is not a programming language or whatever. But for somebody like me from operations, it's the easiest way to get mm -hmm. operators run up and running on, uh, on, uh, yeah. on, on Ob OpenShift or OKD. There's you also, use Helm, go. There's also a yes. bunch of great operator um, uh, talks by Michael Revnek as well mm -hmm. uh, that you can find. And it, there's an amazing group of people in the Ansible world doing um, work with operators. So, yeah, tons of stuff. I just want to give you a heads up. At the top of the hour, we are going to cut off the live yep. stream. So if you want to, and that we'll continue with the, the OpenStack stuff. And if you, and you can take more time if we need to. but. Just let you know. We, we are mm -hmm. flexible. We will um, maybe we should uh, should have a look uh, on the VMs, valid? Uh, we don't. Yes, they are creating. I have the masters creating. Nice. Okay. So yes. the bootstrap. Okay. The image is uploaded. The VMs start. Nice. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and as Diane said, there's lots of resources for operators. One of them is actually learn.openshift.com. It's very easy. You don't need to provision your cluster. You can use one cluster for one hour. And there's lots of uh, small tasks that you can do within one hour. Uh, one main task is the operator framework. Mm -hmm. So you can understand the ABI, you can understand what's the ATCD operator, you can use it uh, as a, for a, the application, it's not for the infrastructure. And you can use the operator SDK, that the one that Joseph was mentioning, and the Ansible Kubernetes, which basically Chris Shaw did uh, a long workshop uh, covering it. And there's an Ansible refresher even if you want to do the. Uh, the, the Ansible Kubernetes module. I think with so, Operator SDK, you get an, a CLI um, where you uh, provide a few, very few parameters, and it will create an operator sub uh, for you. You can Im immediately compile it and, yeah, do a few things, and you have only to uh, fill, I think, two files: the controller and the uh, the API files. Where you can specify own fields for your new Kubernetes resources, and yeah, it's lots of fun to write operators, especially yes. especially if you, for example, if you want to create a database like a MongoDB, there are operators um, that take care about that, or if you want to create VMs, you can use operators yeah, that create F, F, um, VMs on Azure. We wrote an operator. My colleague wrote one. Uh, that creates an uh, VMs on Azure with the help of operators in Kubernetes. Yes. So this cluster is running in Azure. Uh, this was created uh, early this morning. And if you look at the selection you have, you have AI machine learning. In AI machine learning, you have the Open Data Hub operator. Uh, yeah, it's a community operator. So basically, it's a, you don't need to subscribe. And it's very easy to install. You just click on install, hopefully. It will work. This is a live demo, so, and, okay. So basically status unknown, it will uh, try to get okay. the images. And so that's how easy you install a machine learning, deep, lear deep learning environment. It's basically clicks, succeeded. How long did it take? Less than a minute. And now I have a complete uh, machine learning environment using operators. So operators really, what does it have? It has Jupyter Hub, which is the main, interface for data scientists, data engineers to write uh, machine learning uh, module, uh, models. Uh, Apache Spark, 
for data management, Prometheus for monitoring and Grafana, Airflow for workflows. Uh, so if you are not using, uh, and there is Selden also for workflows, Argo for basically GitOps, and Very Kafka nice. for streaming. Very so basically I installed all of these without any knowledge in any one of these in less than a few seconds. That's how easy it is. Now you say, okay, you installed it, but you still need to configure it. Yeah, no problem. Uh, you go here to open data hub and then you create an instance and you configure it. Okay. And there is, uh, if you go back to the OpenShift Commons videos, uh, uh, there are several videos related to how install open data hub and from definition also there is uh, some uh, stuff related to this. Because I saw the, um, because I saw that the hub uh, was using a cheap, um, provides a GPU support. I, I installed a GP, the NVIDIA GPU operator a few weeks ago on also on OKD. It works absolutely uh, smooth and uh, yeah, it's it, it's a lot of fun, and you can uh, play with your create creativity um, to uh, invent new things uh, because you don't have to care uh, much about how things are installed. You can use operators, and it makes life more easier for you. Yes. So it's Reza, still creating. Yes, uh, it's a little bit no? yes. today. Because maybe maybe the other guys from the KubeCon are also creating things. Yeah, can we send them a message in Slack? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Please stop your live demonstration. Stop for five minutes. <laughs> yeah, but but it. Works. I guess they are partying uh, virtually now. I mean, everybody is in his own way. But if you are, if you see that uh, things will magically uh, go away, and in the end you have your UI. You can log in and have fun. But yes. what's also nice with Azure is that um, you can immediately use the autoscaler. Um, I tried it on my own. Oh, it's it's uh, very easy to to do that on Azure, and it's I think it's a, a very important feature to save money that uh, yes. you enable the autoscaler. It's on a, yeah. uh, I think compute. Thank you for reminding me. Okay, because I have a problem uh, because the um, the one problem I have is basically I didn't configure the storage and the OpenShift samples, which are commercial subscription to Red Hat. I don't think they are commercial, but they are basically you need to use the uh, bull secret from Red Hat. Okay, but if I go to the administration cluster setting, I can see there is an update ready for me. So this is the second cluster that I installed. Now how to update and just press this button, update to another version, and then you can select. Okay, they want, nice. want to go? Yes, I want to go. Okay, so now while we are installing one cluster, we are updating another cluster. And it's uh, That's how um, and it's um, your workload is still running. So because uh, yes. the upgrade, it's a rolling upgrade. It will uh, yes. uh, install all the up operators. You can see this in uh, uh, that in this menu here. You will see that uh, after a few seconds, the versions of the operators change, and in the end. Always the last step is always that um, all the all the uh, nodes get restarted, and this is a rolling upgrade. Uh, it's always one master and one worker that gets uh, rebooted, and your workload, if it's cloud native, uh, will run um, and uh, will be not interrupted by the upgrade procedure. That's very nice. Okay, good. Uh, earlier there was in maintenance status updated. Now it's gone. I don't, I haven't seen it before, so I guess this is, it means that when the node was upgraded or something, uh, mm -hmm. when the node was rebooted. Anyway, uh, the upgrade will not continue because it thinks that it's not safe. So the cluster version sometimes will have this, sometimes it's say will not be enabled, but then, uh, and I guess because I have one operator upgraded, yeah. if I get rid of this one, most likely this will be very smooth. But even with this one degraded, most likely it will work. Yeah, well, um, if, if you if you do a if you put that operator into a remove state, um, that will fix it. Okay. Th that's something uh, okay. I, I go. But this is a cluster uh, operator. Can, how can I do it? Uh, uh, hey, how can I do it? I post it in the chat. Oh, you post it. Okay. Uh, this is.
Uh, I see 1051, Joseph. Where, where is it? Ah, this, no, I don't see it. It's coming. You can see my screen, so you can tell me. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to drop it in the chat. Okay. Rolling through my... What are you looking for, for the pull secret or? No, no, it's basically how to disable the samples operator. I think it's um, handy to disable it. We should disable it by default unless somebody wants it, no? But can you, is it possible to upgrade if you remove it? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, if you really? to remove state, um, that, that should do it for you. Mm, okay, nice. Okay, let's try. I go to the console. I go to the cloud shell, I open a new shell. Uh, oh, creation complete, so okay. Now they are getting in completed state. So uh, hopefully, uh, okay, I'm working on live, correct? So I need to work on this one now. Mm, uh, but then. you have to use a different queue config. You know that. Yes, yes, yes. Um, shouldn't, so should, we really do that or should, we, should we have a look for vSphere because? I'll just make sure that I'm on the right cluster. Okay, I am on the right cluster. I apply the update. So it's a batching job for the operator. That's what I like about operators. You just configure the operator and it's very simple. So this yeah. is like, uh, we didn't really deep. agree on this. We didn't do any demos. We didn't do any dry runs. We were busy doing the pull request. <laughs> uh, so that's easy. Let's see now in the console. Short, and then uh, we'll go to the uh, and then we'll go to the fees here. Okay, good. Yes, that okay, looks so. much better. Thank you. Removed. Okay, yeah, now really. let's see if they upgrade. The, so basically, uh, we'll wait a little bit, mm -hmm. and we will see if the upgrade will go on. Okay, let's mm -hmm. go to the fees here. Uh, waiting up. Still, there is something wrong with the bootstrapping. I, I think it's is, it's mm -hmm. taking too long. Could you could you see if we have an OC? Uh, if you have a, a certificate signing request? Oh, yes, yes. So the certificate and user provision, you no. need to sign the uh, workload domains. This is all approved. This is basically the masters and stuff. So we don't have. The OBS, um, the network was not set up. I think, uh, yeah, something is, we had, we had this tagging problem in the start. Maybe this, this was the reason. Okay, the tagging was for the storage or for the network? I think for the, okay, I think for the VMs. Because okay. normally normally it does not stop at this uh, point. So we, we okay. had bad luck. But Azure, the Azure VMs are starting now. Um, it means we should, um, we could. Well, basically, uh, the API is up, yes? Yes, great. And now the bootstrap. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, and I think well, can we, we can log okay. into the. Uh, mm -hmm. You want to? It's. I want to say that it is really nice that uh, on every platform the installation process is uh, is almost the same. Mm -hmm. um, it's even possible to use platforms that are not officially supported, like they I, I installed um, OKD four on uh, Proxmox by selecting a platform none and I, pro um, I provided the ignition files to each VM um, manually and uh, yeah the cluster came up and uh, the, the procedure is always the same if you have um, you have the freedom to to choose um, how you want the things to to set up with UPI I like that very much um, you have full control about your installation and the opposite opposite installation procedure is to use IPI, where you have um, less uh, control about what happens, but yeah, you have to not to take care about it. It's easier. Yes. To start. So bootstrapping in Azure is done, so that's okay. good. We can uh, we uh, so we can kill the bootstrap, but we don't need to. Why? Because basically, the committed installed. I think they kill it. The installer will kill it normally. <laughs> Yes, so now it's basically uh, the masters are in control. Oops, what? Uh, we already have the cluster. So people what? don't look at this. Uh... 
<laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's something with Joseph. I've yeah. seen it. Uh, so I need to log into the. Okay. Is it really yeah. already uh, running? Yes, it is already up. So it's the initial issues with the VMware installation, but they. This is the ABI. Why is it called ABI? Oh, no, no, no. This is the Kubernetes ABI. No, it should be. Ah, oh, this is the old one. Yes, sorry, sorry. <laughs> false, <laughs> false alarm. But is the VMware one up, or is this the? The VMware, we is have it... an issue with the tagging uh, at the beginning. I think we should have resolved it before we continue. Actually, it is coming up. If you look at the. So let's see. Let's see why it's not coming up. Because yesterday uh, we had we had a few problems with the set with the environment. Um, um, I have I have installed um, OKD on vSphere since January this year and it always worked. So yes. um, it it's a so, problem with our setup, I think. Too many cooks in the kitchen. <laughs> yeah, but but um, normally it takes half an hour. We we have we talked um, lots about the insights, and maybe we should have started with the installation uh, just in the beginning and uh, let it install for for the hour. But um, you can believe us, it works either on vSphere and also on on Azure. We have done it several times on this weekend. All right, we'll, we'll we'll let you sit there in the background and run it for proof of life, and um, if you come back, we'll. <laughs> At least Azure will um, will finally end in a working console. Yeah, which I think is in interesting because it's the one you have to do the biggest workarounds for. Yeah, but the workaround is cooked in in the install boot. Uh, you don't, yeah. The only thing is that you have to take care of uh, creating the cache. But even if you don't do this, it should work. Um, there's another way to customize your cloud shell and you get a uh, larger storage if you really need to do several ones. You can uh, also you can also create a VM um, and run the installer there. It's also faster yeah. than uh, doing that in the in the Azure cloud shell yes. because the Azure cloud shell is rather limited in resources. Yes. So as long as you are in Azure, uh, that would be okay. And hopefully, okay. Actually, uh, you reminded me. Uh, if you are, if you want to help out and make Microsoft uh, adopt Fedora Core OS faster, there is a voting here. Really? Yes. So if you can vote to this issue, only, only oh. seven votes. Yes. Uh, right. Everybody much. vote now. Put the we link should, in. We should uh, <laughs> provide this link somewhere yeah. in Slack. Oh yeah, I'll take I don't it. understand yeah. what happens, uh, Valid. I think we are we are um, the hour is over. It's yes. yeah. The 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 only thing you can go on a little bit longer if if you need if you think you'll get the Azure one up. It just the uh, the live stream will will stop. So don't yeah. The blue jeans will continue on forever. So okay, there's the movement. I don't I don't think that it will be mm -hmm. ready in a in a couple of minutes. It'll take. I think my my expectation is it will take another maybe 15, 15 minutes from now on. Waleed, are you are you out there, Waleed? Would you like a last chance to proof of life on Azure? Hi, hi there. Yes, I am here. All right. Uh, I sh I shared the link on the chat. Basically, this is an application uh, from uh, Graham Shipley uh, and. Excellent hatter. Okay. Uh, so basically, should I start sharing my screen? Yep, go for it. And um, okay. it's Wild Wild West app. I remember Grant Shipley doing this. <laughs> it's one of my favorite ways to waste time. And yes, so basically, I'm killing bots. So here it is. Basically, I killed a, a bot and it's recreating it very fast. And the developer experience. You can see the monitoring is really good. Uh, so this is for this project, the Wild West. Uh, the, so the dashboard is up. 
I like this. Uh, this is like this. This is last week release. It's a stable release, and I like it. It's it's perfect. I didn't need to do the uh, the batch. Everything looks fine. So all the operators are working fine. Uh, you can see the memory. Uh, it's really not utilized still. You can see the network transfer. You see the number of nodes, six nodes, and I can click on them and see that it's uh, the Joseph cluster we created earlier. Uh, what else do you want to see? And from operations point of view, it tells me that I can update. There's one release after this, so I guess if I click again, let's see. There's only one release stable after that one. And how okay. long do you think that would take? It depends. Uh, it, it depends, <laughs> really. <laughs> how long is it in, in Saudi Arabia right now? That's the real question. Um, but yeah. Sorry? How late is Is it after midnight now where you are? It's uh, yeah, five minutes after midnight. Yeah, we're keeping you up. Um, mm. well, I think that's a very good proof of life, um, even though the update is failing. I, I think you might, um, might uh, let it go. Did the vSphere one complete? I deleted it. Uh, because, so we thought that that's, uh, that's it, so we deleted it. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I'm sure I can bring it up again. I'm trying the automated one for vSphere, really. I want to get this thing up, yes. Cool. Okay, so the update failed. Uh, change, okay. This is still very early release. I mean, it's not tested very well yet. This is last week, and the update is like two or three days ago only. Yeah. So nobody is playing this game. Yeah. Oh well, it's. I think it's at this point. <laughs> I've been up since. Ah, uh, somebody is playing. I can see. And, um, I can see. Uh, yeah, I can see. About, but but yeah. um. Yeah. Here I'll hit. I'll hit you up a little. A few more times here. Oops. But I think it's. Uh, I think we've hit the end of our um, energy for demos and, and live deployments <laughs> for the day. And I'm really okay. glad you could do that. And this is this is a great slide too for all of the. Um, if you go to full full view it in full production that presentation, a great way to end end the day here. Um, killing pods because there's no better way to pass the time. Um, when you're at KubeCon over the next few days, uh, killing pops is probably what a lot of people are going to be doing. And yes. This, this has been a, a wonderful day, and I, I really appreciate um, the open stackers for getting up early out there in Australia, you for staying up late, uh, Charo for, you know, sticking in there from the beginning of the day. It's been pretty, pretty wonderful. Um, if you want to hear more, um, I highly encourage you to um, check out OKD.io um, and join the OKD working group because you'll get um, the announcements of new events. Tomorrow there is actually a, an OKD working group meeting um, on the Fedora calendar, which I think I'm going to share my screen just for a half a second here and take over. Um, see what did I leave? Oh, see, there I am. I'm shooting you down. Um, <laughs> the OKD working group is meeting, and I'll move this over. And then the Fedora calendar, grab that link. If you're interested, this is um, a great way to um, subscribe to this calendar. I'll put the link in here, and you will get all the info tomorrow. We'll be online again just for an hour um, while we run through. I totally amazed at how many and all of the demos completed. I think the only one was the IPA over um, had, I think we just ran out of time debugging it, but um, we did manage to put in a live um, issue into OKD. So kudos to everybody. Um, thank you very, very much for your time. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing a lot more of y'all um, in the coming months. Um, I, I know I heard from a few folks here who are looking forward to deploying it in production. So as you do that, um, OKD in production, we want to get your feedback. We want to hear your war stories. Hopefully they'll not be war stories. But, um, and as always, updating the docs and sharing the slides to all of this stuff is um, key. So OpenStackers, if you can share your slide deck with me, that would be awesome. And I will endeavor to get this the, the, all the videos up by the end of day tomorrow.
But I look forward to seeing you all online tomorrow as well for KubeCon. So um, if you're looking for us, I should be in the Red Hat Slack channel somewhere. Um, and there are tons of good um, talks coming live at KubeCon tomorrow and the next day. So stay tuned and um, we will hook up at the uh, working group meeting tomorrow and um, let everybody go back to their days. And that's then probably one of the most fun days and easiest working group events I've ever done because I made everybody else do the work. <laughs> so um, I love it. And we'll do it again. So take care all. Take care. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks.